Morning, church. How we doing? Good, good. Hey, my name is uh, Phil. If I hadn't had the chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors here at uh, Salem Chapel. And if, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Let me be the first one to, thank, or to welcome you into a season of uh, twinkly lights, peppermint mocha, and Haynes Mall traffic. Aren't we so excited to be a part of that? As you walked in, you probably noticed the Christmas trees are up, all the lights, and um, up here at Salem Chapel. Um, some of us have been celebrating a while. Some of us have not stopped since last year. You love Christmas that much. Um, I, on the other hand, love Thanksgiving as a holiday, so I hold strong. If you're one of those people with me, you are my type of people, okay? But today we are um, hopping into our series in the book of 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to that. Um, and this series is called Give Us a King. And uh, we're going to be looking at a very important transition point in the life of the nation of Israel, but also even throughout the entirety of Scripture, where Israel really transitions from a theocracy into a monarchy. This is also the, the passage where we get our title, Give Us a King. But for just a little bit of backstory and context to this, this is where Israel is coming out of the period of the judges and really into the period of the kings. See, for the last 400 years, Israel had been ruled by judges. And when I say ruled, they were ruled in in an advisory type of sense because judges, they would not reign and rule in a way that a king would. Judges would have been appointed for a time, um, a specific place, and even a specific season that there would be this particular crisis that, that would rise up, where God would need leadership or intervention, so he would raise up judges to bring leadership and guidance, and he raised up some amazing judges that were not perfect, but that you probably have heard about and have read, guys like Gideon and Samson and even Deborah. And this last judge that God ends up ra- raising up is this man named Samuel. So last week, we looked at Samuel in, in chapter 7, where after 20 years, Israel was worshiping foreign gods. They returned to the Lord through the guidance of Samuel, the Philistine army tries to attack them. While they're at this revival, the Lord thunders. Like, I don't even know what that is, but that sounds amazing. He thunders, right? He confuses the Philistine army, and they scatter. And the Lord protects his people again. He comes through for them. They end up setting up this monument. It's called an Ebenezer stone to remember what the Lord had done, which literally means, till now, the Lord has helped us. See, it's, it's going well for the Israelites. They had turned back to the Lord, but as we take Taken to f- take a look at 1 Samuel 8, we are going to see that they are now a long way away from Ebenezer. That some had time had passed and Israel is now a long way away from remembering what God had done and even waiting or even wanting something completely different. See, they wanted a king who could guarantee them security could guarantee them prosperity and someone they can depend on. And what we'll see and what is so tragic about their request is that everything they longed for in a king, they already had in King Jesus. So we're going to dive into 1 Samuel 8 here. If you have your Bibles, we're going to read the whole entire passage. We don't have three chapters to look at. So when we get a chance to read the whole passage, we're going to because we want God's word to speak before anyone else does. So let's go ahead and read this passage. When Samuel became became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned turned aside after gain. They took bribes and they perverted justice. Then, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations." But the thing displays, displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. 
He will take your sons and appoint them to be uh, appoint them to his chariots and to be with P his horsemen and to run before his chariots and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive olive orchards and give them to your servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants. He will take your female or your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard, heard all the things, all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the, to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word that even though um, God, it was written many years ago about a certain people group at a certain time in a certain place. Your word still rings true in our hearts today. God, that when we look at Israel and how their desire for a king, God, was a rejection of you. God, I just pray that as we dive into your word, as we look into what um, you have to say to us at, at this moment, at this point of time, Father, that you would soften our hearts to see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear. Lord, we love you so much. In your son's name, amen. There is um, something that you need to know about me. I am terrible at song lyrics, right? Anybody else in the room that is just really, really bad at song lyrics? Like, I am awful. There are some people in this world that can memorize any lyric, any artist, and I'm just not that guy. Like, it's just not me. That's not who I am. I saw this video or meme the other day. It was of this mom and her kid. They were listening to the song, Christ Be Magnified. You know the one I'm talking, I'm not going to sing it. I promise you. You guys know the song I'm talking about, Christ Be Magnified. And she never had liked the song because she thought that the lyrics were actually saying, Christ be nine to five, right? Like, she couldn't figure out why Christ had business hours. Like, why, why couldn't he just be 24-7? Like, why did he have to be nine to five? Like, isn't that how he's supposed to be in the first place? Like, she totally misinterpreted the song all along. This is totally me, right? I'm driving in the car, listening to a song. I will make up some type of lyric that I think it is. I don't claim to be good at it, right? Like, if we were gonna go hang out and do trivia and there would be music involved, I would not be the guy you want to, like, lean on, right? I will listen intently to, like, make you think I know what I'm talking about, but I don't, okay? So don't take me to your trivia. There's no chance I'm gonna guess the song. But today, I wanted to do something a little bit different. It's raining outside, and um, it's the holiday weekend. I wanted to play a game today. I get it, youth pastors and games. It's just in our DNA. It's who I am. I can't help it. I wanna make things a little bit more fun. And so this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna play a game called Guess That Artist, okay? Guess That Artist. I'm gonna read you some song lyrics, and I want you to guess that artist. If you're a millennial and under, you're probably not going to guess this person, but good luck. I would probably hate this game if I was in your shoes, but I'm not. So, are you ready? You good? Listen, get your listening ears on. I got you right here. Here's a couple verses. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble or you may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a preacher preaching spiritual pride. You might be a city councilman taking bribes on the side. Maybe working in a barber shop, cutting hair, you may be someone's heir. And here's part of the chorus, but you got to serve somebody. Who is it? Anybody? I failed you if you don't know the song. Nobody? Nobody knows? It's Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is who it is. It's the great theologian Bob Dylan. And I, and I, bring, up, I bring up these song lyrics really because uh, I actually believe that uh, what Mr. Dylan is actually saying here, that he's actually on to something when he wrote or he sings, you got to serve somebody. You have to serve somebody. He says, man, no matter what you are doing, no matter who you are, no matter what background you come from, no matter if you're a preacher or a councilman, a barber or an heir, you have to serve somebody. He has a point, doesn't he? Like, I actually think that he is right, that no matter who you are or what you're doing, no matter where you are from, we all are serving some 
body? What if I was actually to, was, was, uh, if I could speak, sorry about that. What if I was actually to tell you that you were actually created to serve somebody? That you were created to have a king. That this is something that is fundamentally true about human beings. That you are hardwired, intricately woven, and made to have a king. We're created to be ruled. That it's designed in us. It's innate in us. That God has created you and me with the throne on our hearts. That in Genesis, when, we, when God created Adam and Eve, yes, he put them to rule over the earth, but ultimately they were there to serve God, the God that had created them and who reigned over them. God created them to have a king. That even J.D. Greer says this. He says, every life has a king. Every life has a king. That no matter how independent or free you think you are, you cannot escape the fact that there is always something or someone who is the king of your heart. There is always something or someone vying to sit on the throne of your heart. See, if you are breathing today, you have a king. Now, you might be asking the question, all right, what is a king, right? I don't have like this little man like sitting on, my, on the throne of my heart. Like, what does that even look like? What is a king? A king in your life is whatever you must have in order to be happy, to be content, and to be secure. What do you require in order to feel content, secure, and fulfilled? What are you working to obtain? What are you most worried about losing? What are you holding on to that you just can't let go of? You say, man, I have to have this in my life, or at least your actions say that you do. Man, I have to have this much in the bank account. I have to have that promotion. I just have to have it. I have to have that independence or that relationship or that escape. This is your king. This is what is sitting on the throne of your heart. You have to serve somebody. You were created for a king. It's innate in us. So church, before we even get started, who is your king? Who is your king? Because what we will see here in 1 Samuel 8 is that our hearts long for a king, but we often look in all the wrong places for a king. Let's take a look. So Samuel, he, he's getting old, right? He's, as he's getting old, he starts to slow down, and so he does something that is a little bit unusual. He starts to uh, hand over some of his leadership to his two sons, Joel and Abijah. And that might not seem like a big deal to you, but there's a couple reasons why this was a mistake by Samuel. One, these guys are the worst, right? They're awful leaders. They're dirtbags. It says that they did not walk in the way of Samuel, but they took bribes and they perverted justice. These guys, they were not good dudes. And the second was, this was not how power was supposed to be transitioned between judges and the leaders of Israel. Like we had talked about above, Israel's judges, like Samuel, were appointed by God. He anointed and chose for a specific time, in a specific place, in a specific situation. And it was in no way passed down by birth, right? Samson was a judge. His son was not a judge, right? Gideon's son wasn't a judge. So the people here, if you think about it, they're just concerned about, uh, about this, They believe that their system and their leaders and their government is just breaking down. So the elders, they come to Samuel and they say, all right, Samuel, you're getting old, right? Your sons are terrible. I would have loved to have been like a fly on the wall in that, right? Dude, you're old, right? And I do not like your sons, right? How awkward of a conversation would that have been? Like, you literally just called this man old and you just disrespect his family. But anyway, what is going on here is they are concerned, They don't know what is going to happen after Samuel. They don't want to be left with his sons. And they think that, uh, and, and to think, it would be a little naive of us to think that the elders of Israel hadn't been thinking about this for a little while that they wanted a king. And it didn't just spring up into their mind. They had been seeing all the threats around them. They're realizing that God is not operating um, in a way that they expected, operating on their timetable. He kind of seems unpredictable, right? He sails in sometimes at the last minute and delivers them. And they want someone um, just a little bit more like everyone else. So they see this opening of Samuel's deficient sons, and it gives them an opportunity to um, demand a king. They're not really asking. They're demanding, this is what we want. We want a king like all the other nations. Just give us a king. Now, if we were to pause and just look at this request for a minute, if I'm honest, it really doesn't seem that bad, right? 
They're just doing some future planning. Like, they don't want to be left with Samuel's sons. And, and if we're honest and, and read through Judges, they hadn't had the best leaders. They were all flawed human beings. We just want someone we can look toward. I know we have this invisible God. We don't know where he is half the time. And we need somebody that we can depend on, someone strong, someone we can hold accountable. And what if I was to tell you that actually I believe it was God's plan all along to give them a king? If you flip in your Bible to Deuteronomy 17, it'll show you this. It it says that God saw this coming. He knew that Israel would ask for a king. And it was his plan all along. So he gave Israel hundreds of years earlier guidance in how to choose a king and how that king was supposed to be like any other king. This is what it says in verses 14 in Deuteronomy 17. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the other nations that are around me. Sound familiar? God saw this coming. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. And then he will go on to list off what this king should do and should not do. He should not have a lot of horses, right? If you were to think about horses, horses are basically tanks back in the day. That means not collecting a big army, right? Or to intermingle with other nations and take from his people, right? He wasn't to take horses, to take wives and collect money for himself. And then he gave this most important guideline um, to the king in verse 19, that he would learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of the law and the statutes by doing them. Meaning that this king would constantly be coming back to the word of God, constantly be leaning on, on leading on God for direction and guidance, constantly leading with this type of posture. God, what would you have us do? God, help us, guide us, direct us. Lord, we praise you. God, you are our true king. God, I know that I am just a temporary solution here. God, you are our king. God, I know that I I have no power in myself, but God, you are the one that's guiding us. You are the one that's leading us. This is the type of king that God wanted for his people, a king that was constantly pointing back to the true and better king. Not me, but God, God, this is you. God, this is you. God, this is you. God, this is you. So what was wrong with their request? It's not the fact that they wanted a king. No, God was going to give them that king. He had planned for that king. What was wrong with their request? Was God, give us a king like all the other nations. What a tragic statement, right? We just want to be like everyone else. Just give us a king We're done with this. I'm tired of this song and dance. Just give us a king. And what is so devastating is that they were never supposed to be like every other nation. God had set them apart. God had chosen them. He had blessed them. He had rescued them so that that through them, reconciliation of the world would come through them. God said, you're not supposed to be like them. You're my chosen people. This is the king you were supposed to. To have, And this is a side note, church, in the same way, we are not supposed to be like everyone else. We're not supposed to handle our money like everyone else, handle our jobs like everyone else, handle our marriages like everyone else, our singleness like everyone else. We are not to, meant to look to, at culture or influencers and politicians as the measure of how we live our lives. Look to them as our quote unquote king. Our lives should be different and look different because we know the one and true king. Amen? He sits on the throne of our hearts. And those other things, they don't have a hold on us. Israel was never meant to be like every other nation. Just like you and I are not meant to be like everyone else. So the heart behind the request here is not, is the, so the heart behind the request is not, so the heart so is not Samuel, you are getting old. So let's get the show on the road. Let's go to God. Go, Samuel, go to God for us. Let's get the king that he desires for us and he wants for us, like in Deuteronomy 17. No, the heart behind the request here is what we'll see in the few, next few verses is rejection of God and rebellion against him. And it shows the complete lack and trust in him. And what they are actually doing is taking God off the throne of their hearts and they're replacing him with someone else. Verse six says this, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, God, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Obviously, Samuel here, he's upset, right? 
His leadership's been in question. His family is in question. He comes to the Lord, which, by the way, this is a side point, is a great thing to do with your disappointment. But the Lord said to him, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According, all, according to all the deeds they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. God says, your desires for a king is a rejection, a re- rebellion against him. He says this, for they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them. It's as if they have stormed the castle of their hearts, torn him off the throne and replaced him with something else. He says it's because you don't trust me. You believe what you want will be better, give you more and ultimately provide you with more safety and security so you reject and you rebel against him. And he says it's a complete lack of trust in and satisfaction with God. God was supposed to be their real king. They were supposed to rely on him for everything. But from the very beginning, God says all the way back to Egypt, God had never been enough for them. They had never trusted him. They constantly demanded a golden calf, strong armies, guaranteed food and water sources, safe land conditions to feel secure. And you know what the scary part for you and me is? Is that they had never rejected God, uh, flat out rejected God. They'd always said, God, yes, we want you, but we also need a guarantee of this and that. See, there are two ways to reject God. One is to reject him outright. The other is to say that you follow him, but then not really depend on on him and insist on a number of other things being present in your life to feel safe and secure. I've heard it said, irreligious people reject God by not wanting him to be a part of their lives at all. Religious people reject God by letting him be a part of their lives, but not really trusting in and depending on him. Do you see how subtle that is? For most of us, rejection of God is not flat out saying, God, I don't want you. It's saying, God, you're not enough for me. See, the battle of the throne of your heart lies in good things that you think will provide you more security, more freedom, more happiness, and more contentment than God. So you don't reject God. You just add on to him. Add on security blankets or even stipulations. God, I will follow, follow you, but these things are what I require. Have we not all been there? God, if you do this, I'll never miss a day in church again. God, if you heal my child, if you give me that promotion, if you give me the one that I can spend the rest of my life with, God, I will follow you. I will do this, that, and the other. Can we not see that this is exactly what the Israelites are doing? God, you're just not enough. I need more to feel safe and secure. And what God is saying, it's a complete lack and trust in God as our king. I'm not saying that those things are bad things or even God honoring things, but when you start to put stipulations and try to add on to God for safety and security, God says it's a complete lack of trust in him. And this is why. Because when you you don't trust someone is when you feel like you have to control them. And when you try to control God, it means you don't trust him and something else is vying to sit on the throne of your heart. Who is your king? We all have to serve somebody. God says in verse nine, give them what they want. Now then obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Now, some of you might be asking their question, uh, if their request was so bad, God, why did you end up giving it to them? Like, why didn't he just put his foot down and say no and just say this is how it is going to be, right? Why didn't he do that? Here's why. God will sometimes answer your prayers, give you what you want, so that you will see what you asked for in the first place was wrong. Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever wanted something so badly, you desired it, you worked for it, you even prayed about it, and then you got it, and it wasn't what you thought it was or thought it would be in the first place? It actually turned out to bring havoc and chaos in your life. It kind of reminds me of Ralphie from The Christmas Story. You guys all seen that movie, Ralphie from The Christmas Story? If you have not seen that movie, it's 30 years old. I'm going to spoil it. That's on you, okay? Not on me. Ralphie wants a Red Ryder BB gun. So bad, he goes to great lengths. At every corner, he is warned that he's going to do what? He's going to shoot his eye out, right? My favorite part is Santa Claus. He's like, shoot your eye out. Kicks him straight down the stairs. Awesome. Super funny, right? And so 
He, go, he uh, finally, Christmas shows up, his dad, um, after the bunny costume, that's, the bunny costume's the best. I mean, that's the funniest part right there. Anyway, he's in the bunny costume, his dad finally says, hey, you have another present. He gets the present, it's this Red Ryder BB gun. He's pumped, he's ecstatic. He's like, mom, can I go shoot it outside? He's like, absolutely, runs outside. So he takes aim at the target, he ends up shooting the Red Ryder BB gun at the target, it hits the target, it ricochets, and it hits him square in the glasses, and he lands on his back, Right? Some of us, we have felt exactly like Ralphie, right? We got what we wanted. We might have even been warned. We asked for, and it was, it was nothing like you thought it was, and it put you on your back. God gave you the promotion, and it ruined your family. God, you got that house, and you were in debt over your eyeballs, and the list goes on. The one thing that you thought you wanted most in life turned out to be a curse. Why? Because sometimes God will answer your prayers, give you what you want, so that you will see what you asked for was actually your king. See, one of the worst judgment statements here in the Bible is Romans 1.26. And God turned them over to, their, to the desires of their heart. In other words, God's judgment on them was to answer all their prayers. On the other hand, some of God's greatest mercies to us are in the form of, un, or un, of unanswered prayers. I'll never forget being in a church service one day. I was pleading to God about my middle school girlfriend, right? I, for some reason, our relationship was on the rocks. I really wanted it to work out. I was like, God, please save this relationship. Like, I I want this. This is what I want, God. And I look back, and I just say, thank you, Jesus, that that didn't happen. Great girl. I'm sure she's living a great life. Just didn't work out, right? I'm so thankful for that. Like, thank you. You did not answer that prayers. And see, the reality is that some of us right now are praying for something. We're asking for something. We're desiring something. And one of the greatest blessings and mercy in your life is that unanswered prayer. See, the worst thing for you is for God to answer a prayer request and give you something that will allow you to replace him. Is it bad to ask God for things? Absolutely not. It's when you crave those things and feel like you could not be happy and secure without, without them. That is when you have replaced God on the throne of your heart. God tells Samuel to go ahead and warn them. Give them what they want, but warn them. Warn them of the consequences, consequences and what they will be. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king from him. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint himself commanders of thousands, commanders of 50, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war in the equipment of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cookers and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. In that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. What is the reoccurring word in that passage? Take. Take. The king will take your sons and take your daughters It will take your crops. It will take your livestock. It will take your land. It will take, it will take, it will take, and he will use it for himself. And what is so sad about this warning is that Israel was looking for a king that they could find guaranteed safety and security in, and what they would get would be a king that would only take from them. They wanted a king that they could control, but instead they got a king and that would control them. See, when you have any other king on the throne of your heart, you become a slave to that king. That's why it says in verse 17, you shall be his slaves. In other words, whatever you find happiness, security in, you become a slave to. If it's money, you will always be chasing more, seeking more, wanting more. You become a slave to it. If if it's pornography or another physical release, it will never satisfy that inward longing in you. You will constantly be going deeper and deeper until suddenly you cannot stop. You will become a slave to it. And the list goes on. It goes to marriages and kids and jobs and success. And I can't list the amount of kings that are out there today, but remember, rejection of God is not flat out saying, God, I don't want you, it's saying, God, you are not enough for me. When we make these things, when we make these things kings in our life, we're saying, God, you are not enough. 
And the sad reality is these things promise what they can never deliver and will always leave you with less. It will take your best years. It will take your joy. It will take your peace. It will take all that you were looking for in the first place. Just take, just take, just take. See, all of us have a king. And a king in your life is whatever you must have to be happy, secure, uh, happy and secure. And whatever that is, you become a slave of. So chapter eight, it ends with God warning them about what will happen if they get a king. They demand one anyway. In the next few chapters, God gives them exactly what they are asking for. But the question as we conclude is this. Who is your king? Who is your king? Because you have to serve somebody. Church, there is good news today. Because there is a king and his name is King Jesus, the one true king that says in John 10, 10, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is anything that sits on the throne of your heart does. It's coming to steal. It's coming to kill. It's coming to destroy. It's gonna take, it's gonna take, it's gonna take. But King Jesus, no. He says that I have come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. He is the only king that gives. Every other king takes. And what he gave was his perfect life on a cross that took your place and my place to buy back what was rightfully his in the first place, your heart and the throne on it. Church, as C.S. Lewis says, man, we are far too easily pleased with something else on the throne of our hearts. So I offer you the chance today to make a choice that Israel did not, the choice of faith, and you have more to go on than they ever did. We can look back in time again and again and again that God has always been faithful to his people, and most importantly, you have the cross where you see the ultimate display of God's love and faithfulness to you. How do I know that I can trust God because his track record? Man, it's faithful and it's true. There is no king you can serve greater than God. But here's the catch. Here's the thing. To follow God, must step out on faith in him with no stipulations and no conditions. Just trust in the one that created you and died for you. Because just as we saw, add-ons and stipulations is a rejection and lack of trust in him. So today, some of us, we might be sitting here been following Jesus for a long time. And along the road, we have allowed other things in our lives to sit on the throne of our hearts. We made our relationship with the Lord more about contingencies and stipulations, made it more about a contract. God, if you do this, then I will trust you. God is saying, there's your king. It's in whatever you want, whatever you think is gonna bring you security and safety and satisfaction. And God says, they will only take from you. It's only going to take. I'm the only one that can give. So some of us, man, we, we just need to say, Lord, God, I give you. I give you the throne of my heart. I give it to you. Some of you maybe have never made that decision. You have been living for yourself. You've allowed, uh, you're allowing whoever and whatever to rule over you. And God is calling out to you right now that your inward longing for meaning and safety and significance and security can only be found in God. Can only be found in in King Jesus. Whatever decision that is, church, we have a moment to to reflect. Reflect on who truly is sitting on the throne of your heart. Who is it? Because you gotta serve somebody. So make sure it's King Jesus. Make sure it's King Jesus. Don't leave today without making sure It's King Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you that you are the true and better King. God, that you have come and you have given your life. You're the only King that gives. God, you say that you give life and life abundantly. God, I pray that as we reflect during the song, God, as we um, experience your presence and your power in our lives, God, that we can continue to turn to you, continue to see, God, I'll you know what? That's an area in my life that I've been holding on to really, really tight. And you know what? That's actually been my king. I'm basically calling out to God saying, God, give me that. Give me a king like everyone else. God, I want that. When in reality, the only king that gives is you. So Lord, I pray for us today. Lord, we thank you. 
and we love you. In your son's name, amen.